Hello guys and welcome to Classic Car Restoration Live Q&A for October. Uh, a little different face seated next to me today. We've got uh, Terry Wright. I, I sometimes call him by his brother's name and, and, <laughs> and he's quick to remind me that he's not his brother. <laughs> yes. The uh, Terry's a professional body man by uh, auto body man by trade. He's also a technical paint advisor. So you got any paint and body work questions tonight? We've got like a real authority now. I don't know about that, but we'll give it a, we'll <laughs> no, a try. We'll give it a shot. <laughs> the, uh, and uh, before we get too started, I hear what, right down below here, there's a, a place for you to... Uh, uh, there's a place for you to actually show us your car. You know, if right below our, our question uh, question answer box down here, uh, you know, click on that. You know, upload a picture of your car. We want to see your car too. So you know, it's enough that you can come in and see a lot of the cars that we get to work on. But we always enjoy taking the time to see that you see your rides and you know it doesn't have to be done either you know we can you know we love to take a look at cars that are half built or just getting started or even yeah. even if you just bought the car and you're, you got plans for it upload that let us take a look uh and i know a lot of other guys like to look at that stuff too uh again if you have any questions tonight here's your chance get them in now uh uh, let's see, we have, uh, you know, Kim says, uh, my car is behind you. Yes, we have, <laughs> we, we, we do have, we do have a 67 Mustang on the lift here tonight. Uh, it was in, <laughs> in getting some videos and some, uh, uh, we did some video work with the car. We did, uh, the rear disc brake upgrade. We did, uh, uh, also we converted the headlights over to LED, did some projects on it. Uh, we're uh, you know, just about ready to get her off the lift, and uh, so that's in the plans. But yeah, it's uh, it makes a you know, it's a Ford, but you know, it makes it's a good backdrop. Okay, backdrop, right? <laughs> They're <laughs> usually behind us, right? Yeah. Oh, I'm, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> now, 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 Terry is upset all of our <laughs> Ford enthusiasts, <laughs> and you know, this being Terry's last episode. <laughs> <laughs> the uh we'll just hope for that <laughs> um okay you know tonight you know you got any questions now's the time to get them in uh you know if if we don't have the answers we've got groups of experts that will you know either stop in or we can recall actually we uh oftentimes if you if you stump us you know, that gives us homework. So, you know, feel free to try to. I can be stumped pretty easily. <laughs> <laughs> so give us a shot, you know, and uh, we can, you know, we've get, we get our questions in in a few different sources, uh, both on the chat box here on the site, uh, through Facebook, as well as, as sometimes we get questions in early and we just quick print those out. And so feel free. Uh, feel free to ask whatever you want and get, get those questions in now. Uh, our first question of the night, Eugene's going to uh, ask us, uh, can you tell how to convert from a 2150 to a 2100 carburetor on a Ford 360 motor? Okay, the 2150 is the Ford two barrel for the... Uh, you, the those were used primarily in the 70s when the emission stuff came in. Uh, and the 2100 is the ones that were used in the 60s, and that's widely accepted as the, uh, it doesn't have all the emissions stuff to it. It's more, most, most guys consider 2100 a more performance car. Can I tell you how you, you know, what you need to do to convert? Um, I've never made the conversion, uh, you know, uh, especially on the two barrel. Uh, usually what we do is we're dropping in a four barrel at that point, but, uh, well, what's the difference between them? You said one's, one's emission and one's not. Yeah. The 2150 is the later, it had, uh, more provisions for the emissions equipment. Uh, so what would that mean? Maybe just yeah, plug in some know. vacuum yeah, lines probably or plug in some lines and, yeah. um, and they had, uh, 
One of them has a dash pod on the back, so when you let off the, uh, I believe the earlier one, the 2100, has a dash pod. But I now I'm, you know, I haven't burst myself enough. I believe the 2100 it has the dash pod, so if you let off the throttle real quick, it doesn't slam the blade shut and, and you know stall the engine, so it kind of softens the close. But and there's a few other differences between them. Um, as far as whether or not you need the dash pot, you know, just go with whatever's on the carburetor. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, certainly we could probably dig deeper into it and figure it out. Uh, and, and, but that was, you know, my initial take is there shouldn't be a lot of differences between the two other than I know there's more stuff for emissions on the 2100. That you wouldn't hook up to the other carburetor, right? That you wouldn't yeah. hook up to the 2100. And mainly, it'd be a case of plugging those vacuum lines or return lines or those sorts of things. It makes sense. It'd be harder to go the opposite way. Yeah, it would be. But not a lot of guys. Most guys want to go <laughs> get away guys from. Want to get away from the emissions car and get to the the earlier twenty one hundred because they're known for better performance. Uh, Kenny asks, uh, have any experience buying a total car? to do an engine swap. Uh, I'm new to the restoration classic world and have a few questions about what I need to look for or where to even buy a total car, et cetera. Um, any help would be appreciated. Um, when you say it, uh, yeah, it, <laughs> that's a pretty broad question. Yes, I have experience buying total cars for drivetrains. Um, although uh, recently I was at a DeSoto show where a guy took a new charger and grafted the entire unibody structure to a 1948 DeSoto wow. coupe. Uh, well, he had hired a... a a shop and I, uh, and they had actually, and even the interior, they narrowed up the dashboard and used the charger seats and everything. And it was a newer charger. It was like a, a 2017 charger that had been crashed and it would, uh, it had gotten, uh, it, it had been sideswiped hard on one side, but it didn't affect the, the body, it, the structure, the chassis, chassis itself. And ultimate, you know, and if, if somebody told me you could do a complete chassis swap, you uh, to a, from a unibody car to a frame car, I would have said mm, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this was a case where you know, if you hire enough time and money, and uh, where money's no object, and you have uh, somebody else spending their time, uh, it can be done. Because now I've seen it done, and it was very impressive. But so how do you register something like that? Is it the new car or the old car? I would imagine it would be the old car, but it would certainly be up for... Yeah, to debate. <laughs> up for debate. It may, it may vary on what state you're in. Oh, I know sure. some states, you know, they like to title it by the engine. Mm -hmm. Some it's by the chassis. Yeah, the VIN. And in? some, it, it's, you know, some, and they've kind of changed some of those laws in more recent years where uh, sometimes it's like whatever the car appears, you know, so that way okay. the kit car 34 Fords <clears throat> could get registered as 34 Ford, but with new VINs okay. on them or stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I, I would imagine that varies by state. But to take a, to, Buy a total car for the engine and tranny. That's pretty common. That's really common. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even, you know, more than more than you know. No, you there's, know? it's yeah. like yeah for for just the basic drivetrain. Yeah, no big deal. Yeah, uh, that's done all the time. Um, next, we have, and of course, Kenny, if you have any specifics on uh, you know your you know what you know, car you're looking to buy and what kind of car you're thinking about swapping. We'll entertain those thoughts as well. Um, guy, the guy says he's got, he has a 1988 Seville. It has 92,000 miles 
which I've put about 10,000 miles in the last 10 years. Well, that's you, that's about what most classic cars get driven. You know, it'd be somewhere between 500 and 1,000. Um, I've owned it uh, 10 years. I went. It has digital readout and temperature climbs to 224 degrees. I've had it checked a couple of times and can't seem to find why it's doing this. Uh, it, uh, it first overheated about after a four hour, 75 mile an hour trip. Can you help? What should I check? Um, if it's a persistent overheating issue, you know, there could be a number of things that you might want to check, you know, of course, the thermostat, of course, uh, the radiator, you want to make sure, you know, sometimes over time, uh, even if you don't drive it, radiators can build up scale and stuff in them that can, you know, prevent it from cooling. Uh, the, of course, the, 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 the fear becomes, once you get it really hot once, <clears throat> the all kinds of weird stuff can start to happen. You know, you can warp heads. Yeah. You can, what kind you, of damages you do? Yeah, you know, yeah. And you know, two twenty four is not not you know, you know, two ten is boiling a car. You know, under pressure, it'll go hotter than that, and with coolant, it'll go hotter than that with antifreeze. But you don't want to run an engine at 224 too excessively long because it does a lot of damage to other things. And um, but I would start by you know start look by looking at the cheap stuff. You know, replacing replacing things like you know make sure you don't have any coolant in your cylinders or in your oil. Uh, you know, check your check your thermostat or replace your thermostat. So you know, it's a, it's a cheap thing to replace anyway. Is it possible that the the readout or the sender is malfunctioning and that's not correct temperature? It might. Not, yeah, it could very well be. Uh, if if he said his car overheated, though, I assume it must have gotten excessively hot yeah. at some point. And you might, yeah, you might want to check. You know, check with a digital with a laser. Uh, if red temperature thermometer, sensor, yeah. see if you can get like a better reading, kind of figure out where your car is really at. Um, you know, rule out things like you know, yeah, maybe maybe get the you know, it's not a bad idea to clean the radiator out on a car that old, anyways. Uh, Eighty eight Seville. I'm and now I'm gonna I'm gonna show my weakness. I'm, I'm thinking that's an uh, electric fan car too. So maybe there's an issue with the fan coming on or running. True. I'm not 100% guy, so I'm just throwing some ideas out here. I'm thinking maybe that's an issue. I'm not even sure that uh, the 88 Seville has an electric fan. I'm, I'm thinking it might, but uh, you, you could probably correct me on that. Um, it should. And if it's a clutch fan... You know, maybe maybe the clutch is you know maybe the fan isn't engaging still if it's a uh, the clutch is worn out of the fan if it has a mechanical fan. So I'm I'm thinking it's probably electric. So maybe make sure that the fans are coming on and and that you actually ha have cooling going on. Is there a easy way to test to make sure the fans are working though, even if it's not up to temperature? Or is it? <clears throat> well, yeah, I would. Um, Usually, usually it can you know bypass the sender and, and jump it to go direct. Um, Doesn't don't some cars if you turn it on AC, it automatically turns the fans on? Yeah, some yes, is, and some cars do that. Uh, I don't know if that's one of them. But I, don't, I don't know. Usually, it's it, possible. They, it, it, as soon as the engine's up to temp, if you hit it AC or whatever, they should come on, or you know. Yeah, it's one of those things that I would say you need to do a little more research yeah. and figure out, you know, what, you know, are your fans coming on? If it's electric, is your clutch fan still good? If it's mechanical, um, it's a Cadillac, so I'm, I'm assuming it has one of the one of the two. Sure. Um, Go to the simple stuff. Thermostat probably, huh? That's probably yeah, one of the thermostat, easiest things. Thermostat's a good place to start on anything, you know, because they do stick and they do go bad. Mm -hmm. That's why they sell them all the time. Um, and, you know, a 1988 vehicle, 
if it still has its original radiator, could have, you know, could need to have the radiator cleaned out. Sure. Um, yeah, because they all ran deck school back then, and the old, the early deck school had a propensity to, you know, cause a lot of scale and debris inside the cooling system. So it's not a bad idea to just clean out the system and, and see if that helps. And if that doesn't help, then move on to the next thing. You know. uh, do you know what the trim color or code for a 70 Dodge Cornet 500 grill wow. narrow accent that encircles the interior of those grills? Not a clue, wow. but... All right, here, come on, guys. This is this is your chance to show your Mopar knowledge. Uh, uh, the do you know the trim color or color code for the uh, Dodge Cornet 500 grill narrow accent that encircles the interior of those grills? You know, I know they used a lot of like what they called argent silver and a lot of that stuff back then, but boy, you know, mm -hmm. you've got, you've got me on this one. Um, they weren't very good at documenting the, trim codes either, <laughs> much less the well, exterior it, code. This is, well, this is, this is in the dogs. inside of a, the grill. The grill, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I would say, We've got to have we've got to have some Mopar uh, experts in our in our in our listening audience tonight. Here's your chance. Let us know. Otherwise, we'll come back and and try to we'll talk to the Mopar experts and get some advice uh, and put it in later on. But you know, offhand, no, I, I not without doing some research. Uh, Alex asked, "Do you guys have any advice?" Or help regarding buying uh, classic as a first car. I have uh, narrowed it down. Need some help thinning the list down. Either a 1971 International Oil Harvester Travel All. Uh, like it's that. the first right-hand drive one I found, which happens to be a barn find or. A 67 Jaguar 420, oh, which, wow. <laughs> which apart from being poorly painted, metallic lime green seems in, in good shape. Uh, um, wow, that's two ends of the spectrum. A 71 International Harvester uh, that you say is a right-hand drive. So I'm assuming, uh, Alex, you are not in the United States. So an international harvester might be pretty cool in the, you know, in Australia or in or I think it'd be cool anyway. UK. I you know yeah. well, they're, kind yeah. of, they're kind of fun vehicles to drive. Uh, the uh, the sixty seven Jag four twenty, yeah it you know, it it's like anything. Uh, the Jags are Jags are good solid cars. They sometimes require a little more fiddling than uh, most because, you know, it's just the nature of the beast. I'd probably be more apt to go to the International Harvester being scared of the Jaguar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Not because it's poorly painted either. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, paint is, you know, well. That's easy. You being the paint expert, you know, you could like, you know, say, hey, you could strip that down and paint it and you know, a week or so if it's a good straight body. Yep, clean, rust-free bodies. That's more important than the paint, that's for sure. Yep. The, uh, yeah. I well, don't know. That's kind know. of a toss-up, really. What What are you more interested in, yeah, you know? And, and, you know, again, we don't know exactly where he's at. I'm thinking if he's looking for right-hand drive, he's probably, you know, overseas. Because uh, there's not a lot of right-hand drive stuff here in the States. No. Um, but you know, I, you know, I think it's cool. I think it's cool to be, you know, heck, it could be cool to have a right-hand drive international here in the state, you know? Yeah, it would. So you're not going to give them any help and pick for them? I, you know, <laughs> they're both nice choices. I would, you know, just for the ease of, if you haven't restored a lot of cars, I'm thinking it would be, the international would be an easier other than finding parts, you know, but I don't know what the parts availability is where you're at. 
But if it's complete and reasonably straight and not in a fairly solid body, yeah, yeah, I'd go with the International. I think it'd be a fun vehicle to have. That sounds like fun to me. Yeah. Uh, is it? Oh, oh, we have a Bondo question. Time for you, Mr. Body Man. <laughs> it's po Ron asks, is it possible to use Bondo and or all metal over well sanded paint? I think that uh, <laughs> no matter how I answer this, I'm going to be wrong. <laughs> <clears throat> well, huh. so yes and no. How about that? So, yeah. oh, wow. um, not so much the filler. You can glaze over a sanded paint uh, with a polyester glaze, mm -hmm. but the filler, I don't think I'd be wanting to put it over the paint too much. Mm -hmm. um, filler, uh, you want to go to clean metal or epoxy mm -hmm. um stay inside your feathered paint but you can go up you can take some uh, glaze or polyester that, that gets up into the paint mm -hmm. if you I, i'd say if you have something some shallow dense yeah you could use a you could use a polyester glaze over that but mm -hmm. uh, i wouldn't i'd stay away if you've got any serious body work to do with some filler i probably wouldn't uh I probably wouldn't use it. All metal, I used that way back in the day. I definitely wouldn't use that over paint. Um, so it's kind of a yes and no question. Mm -hmm. uh, your fillers, you want to go to clean abraded metal and or epoxy metal. Uh, but paint, um, well sanded or not, if the paint's not of that good quality. Mm -hmm. That could be the weak, weak link in the whole, mm -hmm. the whole process. So like, eh, it's questionable. I don't think I would, uh, but some light glaze, I, I guess I wouldn't hesitate to, to glaze over it. Yeah. And uh, from my own experience, you know, yeah. Uh, whenever you're putting anything on top of old paint, it's like, okay, now you've got the, you know, you don't know how well the surface below that paint was ever adhered. For sure. Unless it's a factory paint that's still on there. And then still at that point, it's like, I know I've gotten heat on here before. There's, a, you know, there's, there's always somebody that's going to tell me I'm doing it wrong. Because I, I typically, after I, when I start a restoration, I, I like to start with the whole car in bare metal. And then I, then I epoxy prime every square inch of it. And then I start to do my body work yeah. on top of epoxy. And I know I've gotten some heat on here before when I, like, you know, if I have a hammer not dense, and I don't always take all the epoxy off. I don't bring it to bare metal if there's, <clears throat> if I can glaze over it. If I got a, if I've got the surface roughed up, mm -hmm. so I know I have a good mechanical bond as well as the chemical bond, then I know I've never had issue. I've got cars here that I did body work on. Uh, 40 years ago and they're still holding yeah and so i you know i don't buy the argument that i have to be a, a putting body filler just on bare metal the uh, there's even a manufacturer and i won't say which one it is but they their procedure their sop is to put epoxy down first before your filler so they mm -hmm. want that filler sandwiched in between okay. epoxy yeah so you're not wrong but some different schools of thought yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, yeah, I've gotten, I've gotten the heat before, but you know, that's all right. I'm, you know, there's always more than one way to skin the cat. There sure and, is. Uh, you know, especially when you get into body and paint or engines, everybody has an opinion about what is the correct way to do right. it. And uh, another point about the Santa paint, it depends on if it's really old paint, say it's lacquer paint. No, absolutely not. Don't do that because that's a soluble substrate and it can it'll expand and contract and if you can wipe it off with some lacquer thinner you can do a little test with the lacquer thinner solubility just wet it rub it try to rub it off if it does not come off it's pretty decent okay so it's probably been catalyzed or hardened right and right. but if it's lacquer that's coming off and you don't want to put anything over the top of that not even in new paint i would i'd get that off yeah. so it really kind of depends but uh some serious filler work i probably wouldn't overpaint I wouldn't hesitate glazing over paint. Hmm. Well, there you go. The uh, okay guy writes it, it does have a fan. Okay, does it have an electric fan or a mechanical fan, guy? 
appreciate the comeback guy. Um, we're in, have you tested the fan that they're, you know, if it's electric, is, is it running? And if it's a mechanical fan, you know, go up and grab the blades while it's turned off and not running and see if it wiggles or, you know, is sloppy and see if your, maybe your clutch is out. Um, Peter writes, what causes small blisters, whoops, small blisters or bubbles in paint, oh yeah, in one fender of mid-year vet, lacquer painted 40 plus years ago, oh, I'm thinking poor prep. Yeah, I'd go with the poor yeah, prep. Yeah, usually, usually when you see blisters or bubbles in paint, it's a sign of, of, of Rust on a car, most cars, but on a vet, you're not going to have yeah. rust on your Corvette. So what is that? Well, it's letting go for some reason, one way or reason or another. Mm -hmm. um, lacquer, I think I just talked about it. It's, it's, it'll take and absorb mm -hmm. moisture, solvents, and it'll go right down to the substrate, and it'll, it'll probably, something got in there and loosened it up. Or it could have been there when they originally painted it. It could have been contaminated when they originally painted it. Yeah, and lacquer, you know, yeah, you can't hardly buy lacquer anymore. You can, but it, it's tough to buy. Right. Uh, but, you know, lacquer, lacquer paint requ uh, requires, it doesn't, it doesn't just need, it requires a fair amount of maintenance. It needs to be waxed and sealed and, and polished. And, uh, and what happens is, is those paints age, uh, there was a time everything was lacquer, but as paints age, they, uh, the lacquer in particular doesn't necessarily expand and contract at the same rate sheet metal does. And I know this for a fact because we did one, we did a car with, you know, we, we were prepping to send down to uh, a big car event in February here once, and we had 25 coats of lacquer on it. And, all clears and candies and everything else, and it looked amazing. And we pushed it outside to load it on the car trailer at 20 degrees outside or 20 below out that day. And we, uh, in the time that it took us to get the straps and things out of the garage and go out and start to uh, get ready to load the car, a huge chunk of paint fell off the side of the car because me. the metal contracted more than the paint did at that point. Yeah, the lacquer, when it heats and it expands and contracts, it'll just, it'll crack. It'll mud crack. Yep. Yeah, it'll it'll definitely, it won't, it just can't take it. Yeah. It just, Not like enamels know. or other things can do it. So it, you know, my Especially guess. Especially if it's thick. <laughs> <laughs> really thick. And then it really stop. Yeah. And like, yeah, it, I think that happens with a lot. You know, I think, you know, I've been accused of putting paint on too thick before. Even enamels, <laughs> you don't want to put on too thick. No, you really don't. I mean, there's a max for anything, but. Um, but as to your blisters, yeah, something's compromising the paint surface, either from the top or from the, you know, you know it could be that, you know, actually fiberglass itself breaks down over time. Um, and and we I've seen that in a number of old vets where it actually starts to get brittle if it's been exposed to sunlight and, and just has not also been very well maintained. So, uh, so is is there the paint bubbles could be something that's compromising the paint if it was painted in lacquer 40 years ago and you're having paint adhesion issues it may be time to i mean 40 years that's that's a long time to expect any time. paint job. i had the same little paint blisters on my firebird but that's that's metal and it was lacquer paint when i took it off when i took mm -hmm. all the paint off little rust specks everywhere there's a little bubble so there was no doubt that moisture got through there and that's it, that's what was bubbling up yep and back in the 60s acrylic lacquer was common for that was normal yeah. yeah yeah the uh, raymond writes he's uh, replacing the rear quarter window molding and weather strip on a 71 cutlass supreme sx convertible uh how to attach uh 
71 Supreme SX convertible. How do you attach? Uh, how do I attach the, the rear quarter window molding? Um, oh, the weather strip. Weather strip on the, the front of the strip. quarter glass? Is that what it is? It's, yeah, I think that's what you said. Um, use blue weather strip adhesive. Normally, if, if there's not a provision, a lot of the cars of that era had, you know, either wire or plastic clips that were embedded into them. But if there's not a provision on your weather strip to do that, I would guess some kind of adhesive. Some weather strip adhesive, but if it's, I'm trying to think of what that is, but like on my Firebird quarter window, it was just a, a strip that slides on a channel. And at the very bottom, there's a Phillips screw that goes in where you don't see the glass, you don't okay. see when it's rolled up. And there is nothing, no adhesive holding that in, but if there's no mechanical way to hold it in, I'd use some weather strip adhesive. Yeah, yeah like, I, uh, like 3M mm -hmm. Super or whatever yep. weather strip Yeah, adhesive. I'd probably use the black, not the yellow. But, okay. Um, yeah. You have a preference for the black usually over the yellow? It doesn't look as bad as the yellow when, it, when you can see it. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in a black car. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I was just wondering yeah. if there was a, uh, you know. A difference between them? I don't know. I think yellow used to be the, the common color way, way back in the day, but I, black's pretty. And maybe they got rid of the yellow. I don't know, but I've seen both. But I, I, I currently use the black. I have yellow. I have uh, yellow and black in-house. And um, I, you know, yeah, usually the, yeah, I, the only time I, I use the black is when there's a, potential for it to show just to, to see it sure and then it's like well if you know and then sometimes i use the yellow and then wish that i'd use the black so <laughs> yeah the um uh guy right uh, it's electric yes it runs well, that's good oh yeah, well that's good that's that okay yeah i you know i'm still thinking guy you might want to double check thermostat might want to double check that's the first place I'd look is, is thermostat. 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 Yeah. Thermostat be the first place I'd look too. And then the second place I'd look would be I well, I just replace the thermostat. If you haven't replaced it recently, do it. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's it's under twenty dollars. Most of them are under ten dollars. And the uh, it, it should be part of your routine maintenance anyways, even if you don't drive the car thousands of miles just because they stick over time. Uh, your thoughts on lifting on lifting a 58 year old vet using a frame type lift, no visible rust damage seen. Uh, car frame flex. Um, I'm thinking you're, you're talking about like a two post lift. If the, if it's got a solid, you know, if the frame is solid, I wouldn't think twice about it. Uh, putting a two post no, lift. No, yeah. no. You're, you're, you know, it, it should hold up just fine. Um, if your frame, if your frame is weak or, you know, if you suspect it's, it's, you know, rusty or something. Yeah. Maybe don't, be, you know, but essentially your car is held up by four points anyway. So if it's four points on the, the, the chassis or if it's, you know, four points with a lift, it, you know, the frame is hold, strong enough to hold the car up itself. Mm -hmm. So I, <clears throat> I find it hard to think you'd get that much flex. I, I've never heard of anybody having extreme car flex out of a, using a two post lift. No, it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Um, Raymond, my main question is attaching the chrome molding to the glass. Oh, oh okay. Well, okay. It, okay. Now we, now we understand. Yeah. Um, on mine, it was just a, a rubber, uh, not a gasket, but oh, yes. you, you put in the chrome channel and it, you Which, for, for, force it, it on. It, it's, uh, it's, it's a, what they call an edge seal. Okay. And I'm going to, I'm going to quick grab some you, so I you can show here. Some? I've got a roll here. They're not the easiest to get on. <laughs> the, get, oh, getting them out of the. It's not easy to get it on. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's the stuff. Okay. They, there's a, there's a product called Edge Seal and 
It looks like, and it comes in in you know big rolls. You're gonna have to buy a monster roll of it, <laughs> <laughs> like and, you did. And what? Or you can go to a glass shop, and and a lot of times they'll sell you three feet of this if you know if you have a glass shop local. Even if they even use this in some industrial applications for setting glass uh, in office buildings now that okay. everything glass and everything but uh this stuff comes in different thicknesses and and it's it's kind of a like a rubbery mm -hmm. uh material and the advantage of this stuff is that it just kind of form you know you just kind of tape this around the edge of your glass and then you take a, a soft mallet and you tap your chrome piece onto the edge and i encourage you to check out we uh we've got a, vid a couple of videos that we've done with jim lundquist who's a uh, expert glass uh, installer uh we've got some videos where he's actually using this to install that chrome around the edge of a piece of glass or you know it works even on the edge of glass if you got wing windows i know on my 35 mm -hmm. chevy it's just chrome on on you know half of it or three quarters of it and then the one side is open glass and it's just a matter of taking this stuff wrapping the glass and it just kind of it's just kind of a uh, it's a friction, friction fit, fit or a yeah. wedge fit yeah. and then you tap it together and it it holds you leave it you know leave it for an overnight and then the next day it's it's a pain to get it separated yeah. actually would you so, recommend any kind of lubricant on there to help get that on? Uh, it, I do. I use a, a little bit of window cleaner and just kind of spray it, spray it with a little window cleaner. You know the the you know usually invisible glass or something mm -hmm. like that. Just yeah. kind of spray it with a little, and that gives it just enough lubrication to help slide everything together a little easier. And it dissipates. It's not like you yeah. you don't want to use anything that's not going to go away over time. Okay. And when and you're then, all done, just take a cut and the then edges. Any, with yeah, any excess that's left after you get this your chrome all hammered over this, you got a little bit of extra hanging out the edges. Just take an exacto knife, trim it right off, yeah. and uh, you know a good sharp blade isn't going to scratch your glass, and and just kind of cut the excess off, and you'll be good. Can be a bear, but it's doable. It's doable. Yeah, I, you know. Yeah, done it many times on a lot of cars even I, even the glass that holds on a lot of 60s cars the channel that holds oh yeah yeah, yeah. the the glass on you don't see it that holds the bottom of the glass to the mechanism that's also set with the same material sure before they bolted them in yep yeah then that, yeah then they went to bolt them. i'd probably make sure that the, i wouldn't have the weather strip on there before you're starting to hammer that chrome on the glass so <laughs> put your weather strip on last well, you might want to take the glass out and do it on yeah the it'd be much easier back. it's you could do it in but it'd be it'd be a lot easier no for yeah. sure yeah you would run real, less of a risk of yeah messing something that's up. funny that you happen to have a roll that <laughs> just happen to have a roll of that just happen to have oh, no, i got two rolls of this <laughs> why two I you're not going to use one i have a lifetime supply here uh yeah we don't set a, a lot of glass uh but you know it doesn't take much to you know you set a few pieces and then it's like well now what am i going to do with that <laughs> um Peter says, thank you. You're welcome, Peter. Anytime we can help. Let's see, Ron writes, what paint do you recommend for the do-it-yourselfer single stage or base coat, clear coat, uh, enamel or urethane, etc." cetera? Ooh, mm. I'll be anxious to hear the paint expert's opinion <laughs> on this. <laughs> for your do-it-yourselfer, single stage, base, well, it depends, I'd say. Um, uh, if it was a solid color, I'd for sure, I'd just go single stage, uh, unless you're really looking for that depth of clear coat. You can and you can still clear coat single stage. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a metallic or something, much easier to to paint a base coat clear coat. So much easier to control because um, the base coat is just color, and you want to 
make it look uniform and look good. It's not doing anything other than the color, you know, the clear coat's giving you your protection. Mm -hmm. And spray and clear is, it, base coat clear coat's real easy. Uh, a single stage metallic isn't necessarily easy. Now that's all there was back in the day and there were the guys that worked wonders with it and were very good at it. Um, but not anymore, it's, mm -hmm. it's very rare, but um, do it yourself or I think it depends on the color. Um, white, I wouldn't hesitate to single stage that all day long or solid, any solid color. Mm -hmm. But if you're really looking for that depth and if you wanna clear it, you can even clear it. Now it's gonna be more expensive. And it'll be a little cheaper to go uh, with a, just a base coat under a clear coat yeah. than a you know a regular top coat. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's that's kind of where I would be with it. Mm -hmm. um, I personally, I I I like single stages um, for solid colors. I don't like them for a metallic. I just don't forget about it. It's yeah. just it's just too hard to. And, and you know. Uh, I mean, uh, as a non-professional painter, <laughs> the uh, I have found, yeah, yeah. I used to shoot. Well, I shot everything, you know, everything single stage for years and years and years. And I have special agitating guns and everything else just for shooting metallics. Mm -hmm. And you know, just because it the in the old days with the old DuPont Duluxes and, and all these paints to where all the metal flakes just wanted to keep dropping right out. And you'd go to like, you know, you'd set your, if you weren't constantly agitating the metallic in there, you go to, if you paused for too long and go to take a swipe, then you had like all, you had a real heavy metallic pass. Nice stripe. <laughs> and then, then you were fighting that the rest of the the rest of the paint job essentially at that mm -hmm. point. So yeah, and having done you know, I would never consider doing a metallic or any kind of any kind of pearl or anything else. Any any effect color, I would any not do. anything without doing base coat clear coat nowadays. Way too easy. Way too easy. Yeah. Way too easy base it's, coat because basically, when you're shooting base coat, you're just making sure you have good coverage. You know, you're not trying to make sure you got the you know the perfect wet pass on your. Uh, you know, you want an even film, but it's not, mm -hmm. it's not like it is Uniformity, when you're doing a final coat, you know, yeah. you're doing, so you're just getting, so the metallic base coat is so much easier and then you come back and then you can worry about getting, you know, your clear, nice and flowing and everything else. And, and the advantage there is if you, heaven forbid, if you do run a clear, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can usually color sand it out and buff it, and nobody's going to know the difference. If you have a single stage metallic and Forget you it. run a metallic, mm -hmm. you're never, even if you get that, you sand it and get that surface 100% smooth, it still has no, the yeah. silhouette no, of yeah. the metallic no, be because it, it yep. has formed its own uh, shape. In yeah, there. clear coat's really user friendly. So, it's easy to, yeah, you can repair that. The repairability is great. Single stage metallic, forget it. You're not gonna repair it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, beyond some light compounding or waxing, mm -hmm. not heavy compounding, because you're gonna mess, you're gonna move that metallic around. Yeah, it's gonna yeah. look ugly. So yeah, the, I agree. I, I I like the look of a single stage. Uh I for a guy starting out, um, I'd say it depends what you're gonna shoot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I have no fear of single stages, I have no fear of base coat clear coat. Mm -hmm. But I like, on an older car, I like the look of a single stage paint where it should have been there. Um, I think there's too many times where I see, you know, you know, 40s and 50s and, you know, even some of the early 60s cars where they, you know, their base coat, clear coat, and to me, they just don't look right because they have that different gloss to them. Yeah, there's a depth to that. It's where a single stage is just, boom, it's just right there. Mm-hmm. What you see is what you get, and some guys want that depth, and that's great. Go for it, but yeah. um, you know, um, yeah, clear coat's easy to work with and maintain. I, either one, it depends on the color, really. Yeah, and and I think you know, if I had any advice for guys starting out, is just you know, if if you know, paint paint's not as cheap as it used to be, uh, but you know, just 
you know, do some things, you know, get out and, you know, there's yep. no, there's no substitute for just grab, grabbing a gun and painting something. Test not on your car, but on something else. You know, it doesn't doesn't have your first paint job shouldn't be your classic car, uh, but maybe your your daughter's five hundred dollar beater, and then your mother in law's car, <laughs> your, your, your mother in law's <laughs> car, and then you can move up to something that you really care about. So you know, it, it it's a learning process, and get as much information and advice, and you know, if you got some buddies, ask around and. And 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 get some doesn't hurt to get some hands on help from no no doubt no people doubt. that actually been through it a few times yeah but don't shy away from it it's yeah oh oh yeah I agree yeah um what do you recommend for uh, no nope, there okay uh on the grill question the color looks like orange or reddish orange and it runs parallel. Mm with the form of the grill and it came on the RT super B's in early production 500s. Okay. So we're looking for what is the paint code for that reddish orange trim on our part of the grill on those cars. Uh, great. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we've got one Mopar, some good Mopar guys out here that might have the answer. Yeah, that knows what they uh, use. Otherwise, right. otherwise we're going to have to do, yeah, we, we, we're hoping somebody pipes up so we don't have to go home with home. There just today. really isn't, I mean, even if we would, did try to look it up, there's just not good documentation of accent of, colors. Okay. There just isn't. Yeah. And on a seventies car, yeah, that's, that's tough. Um, I had the same problem on my Firebird with the grills and wheels, and it's mm -hmm. it's not documented. So you kind of got to trust what other people have been through. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes yeah, sometimes that involves you know asking you know some of the the re people that specialize in restoring those year makes them. Uh, I know our good buddy Bob Wilson down at RJ Restoration. He has a book like this big of every every silly detail on a Boss 429 Mustang. And it's, it's you know, he's accumulated stuff over the years and, and, and every detail and every, you know, paint stick marking, every sticker, every, and he has it all logged into this huge book. And, he, you know, that's why people, you know, bring him cars to restore from across the country because he's that fanatical about the detail, but, you know, those people are out there for every... Somebody knows what that color somebody is. Somebody knows exactly yeah. what that color is. Somebody yeah. can tell you. But as far as looking it up, I don't know if that's, that's not that yeah. easy to do. I, we're, yeah, I'm sure we can, you know, if nothing else, we can keep putting it out there and yeah. see if we can get the, the right solution. But uh, it's out there. Wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Raymond says, thanks. You're welcome to Raymond. Uh, Tom writes, a lot of people are switching to fuel injection. I currently have a 64 Chevelle with an IROC 305 tube port injection. Uh, it looks great up. <laughs> it looks great up. No one seems to know how to work on it. Yeah, that's the early, early TPI fuel injection stuff. Um, the... Uh, I know, I know our friends at TPIS, uh, you can call Jim Hall over at TPIS. You can look TPIS up in the, if you're having an issue with, uh, with your IROC 305, you know, he, they, they sort of built their whole business around uh, tune port injection. Uh, they, you know, they're, was, you know, when Myron Cottrell, who, who launched it and, uh, he ran that business for years up until his passing, but he, he sort of built that whole business around just, you know, getting the most performance he could out of the, the TPI, uh, the tune port injection system. So if, if you're running into an issue with one of those, you know, yeah, that, that, you know, I would, wouldn't hesitate to give those guys a call in a second. Um, the, uh, yeah, there's you know they've kind of moved beyond as far as you know the the tune port injection back in the not you know in the 90s and stuff that was like the hot thing to have and you're you know is especially some of the street rods and stuff you know pop open the hood and there's TPIS you know, or, or tune port injection unit on there 
yeah. with the big runners and all that stuff. It looked cool. Look cool. You know, it, it's probably, it's not state of the art anymore. And I, I imagine as time goes by, there's going to be a few, fewer people supporting that product. Um, but that's not to say that they're still not out there. I'm oh, uh, sure they are. The, uh, it's just a matter of finding who they are and what they do. But now there's so, there's so many great uh, fuel injection units available on there on the market that, you know, it, it uh, surprises me more people don't adapt to it. Although, you know, like I said, TPIS still makes like, uh, they have like a mini RAM that uh, is kind of based off that whole platform. And say, Tom has a follow up on the. Oh, let's see. On the. Sorry, I didn't finish the question. TPI or fuel injection system is. Fuel injections in general. Hmm. Sorry, I didn't finish the question. Um, my question in TPI or fuel injection system in general, uh, it's I think they're good. They're awesome. If you want to, you know, is in general on a general thing, is it good to run fuel injection? Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. You know, it's more fiddling, <laughs> fiddling with stuff. It's like you know, I know guys that just really get. You know, it depends on what your interest area is. Yeah, you know, I like carbureted cars just because I like to, you know, you know, turn screws and hammer on them with my screwdriver. I'm with you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't mean that you know, if you want to get the maximum amount of performance and you know, drivability and everything else out of your car, yeah, you can't beat fuel injection. You know, it adapts itself to the current temperature outside. It does a lot of things a carburetor will never do. But there's just something kind of pleasurable about the mechanics. They, you know, kind of just turning screws and wrapping on it and doing things. So that's kind of, you know, that's just my take on the experience. My classic car experience isn't based on, you know, hooking a laptop to my car. But some guys are. Some guys are really wrapped into that. If that's where you're at, there's no denying it. It's uh, if you want to make a modification to your car that's going to increase your reliability and drivability and give you the maximum amount of performance and give you infinite amount of tunability to your car, fuel injection is the way to go. Terry won't argue. With I'm, I won't argue, and I'm, I'll stay <laughs> quiet on this one. <laughs> Let's see, uh, Robert writes, he's got a 64K62 electrical problem. A battery dies after three or four days of just sitting. So he's got a parasitic draw or something on it. If you disconnect the positive lead and reconnect it with a charged battery, you can hear a relay clicking in the driver's side kick panel. Uh, is it a, yeah, it might be a relay or maybe a circuit breaker. Um, this is with everything off and the door closed, no interior lights on. Any idea what may be causing the relay to pull in and drain the battery? Um, <coughs> and, and yeah, we've done. It depends how big of a draw you have. Uh, I know we, uh, I have, you know, you can run it. If you got a, you know, a decent multimeter, you can't like have anything on. And in and, and the way, the first way I test for a parasitic draw is just, is I disconnect the battery cable and then I just kind of get the cable. I just kind of tap the cable on top of the terminal. If it sparks, if it sparks heavy, it sparks really heavy. That's usually a sign that, you know, something's, you know, you're completing a circuit that has a lot of draw on it at that point. You know, there's always stuff that's going to run. There's going to be, you know, clocks and mm -hmm. little things. But on a, you know, on a 64 Caddy, there's, you know, other than clocks, there's probably, you know, or anything else that you may have uh, converted it with. There's not going to be a lot of, Parasit, you're not a lot of constant draw on things. So likely there's something something that's creating a draw. Now there's enough electronics in a 64 caddy that shouldn't be powered on. 
could be a glove could, box light, could be a trunk light that you don't see when it's closed. And, and you know, what we've done before, and, and actually if you just do like an internet search on parasitic draw, you can take a multimeter, you can disconnect your ground lead from the battery and actually run and set the meter to amperage draw and it will actually read it for you but a most, most multimeters ain't going to take a lot of load this way so if you have a big draw you, you don't want to hook your multimeter up in, lo in line because you'll blow the diodes out on it but if you have a little draw then you can go in you know put somebody you know under the dash with a pliers and start pulling fuses until you see which one eliminates the draw um, the uh, it, it's anything electrical is usually a way is, is just a matter of going at it and systematically saying okay we've got a problem we're going to isolate it by eliminating things or you know you could theoretically go in and pull all the fuses out of your box and put them in one at a time mm -hmm. and find out which one creates the draw then you know where the circuit which circuit has the uh, has an issue with it and then you can isolate it to what components are in that circuit if it's a power seat circuit or a power window circuit or a, or a, a heater air conditioning circuit and, and soon as you, then then it's a matter of isolating it yeah. further. What component in this and a good wiring diagram is a big help in that. Yeah. yeah so uh, narrow it down anyway. Uh -huh. A good place to start. Here's the question for you: Does clay bar damage clear coats? Mm -mm. No. It cleans clear coats. It'll <laughs> it'll take off contamination off clear coats. No, I won't damage it. No, mm -mm. no, that's what you typically use to get overspray off or rail dust or any kind of fallout that's stuck in your paint. No, it's no, that's probably the first step in cleaning or detailing your car before okay. you want to buff it up. I've seen some guys that, that purport that clay bar is you know, the end all. You got to really start with clay bar and it's like, I mean, there's a place for it for sure. I, you know, and to me, it's like, it's always seemed like I'm not doing a darn thing when I'm clay bar in a car. It's that I'm I'm rubbing this yeah block on What's a slimy fender, and it's like, yeah. is this doing anything? Yeah. Uh, where I've used in the past in, in the body shops was for rail dust for getting rail dust off, and that's just uh, little bits bits of iron from rail cars landing on it when they're tra in yeah. transit, okay. and that they'll just rust and create a little rust speck, and that they were it works really good for that. It works great for overspray. Um, I guess if you wipe your wipe your hand in your car and you feel something gritty that's catching, yeah, use it for sure. Okay. Yeah, before you start sanding on it or compounding. Sure, why not? No, it doesn't hurt. No, it doesn't hurt your clear coat. Cool. Well, I see we're we're getting uh, uh we don't have any more questions, uh, guys. Uh don't oh wait we got one more coming in but uh we'll read this in a second before i before i forget um go uh right below us here is uh right below the, the the comment box there's a window here that says show us your ride don't forget to go out there post picture your ride i want to get let's let's get a lot of new cars out there i want to you know i love seeing seeing uh not only your your finished great projects but your uh uh, cars that are, you know, being restored or your future projects too. You know, it's always neat to see what you guys are up to. Okay, Ron writes on the Mopar color code questions. Right. I would re recommend oh, graveyard cards, Frank Yeah, they might. Yeah. They might help you. They he would, he help would know. You. He would know. <laughs> you know, they would know, or they would know. I have a paint number for you, or something. Mm, yeah. Um. The uh, you know the, they're one of. You know, and and they may or may not want to talk to you. Uh, you know, I'm sure they've got like enough Mopar questions coming in constantly. But there's tons of Mopar. You know, yeah, they uh, those guys get lots of press coverage, and and no doubt are you know uh, serious Mopar restorers. But they're not the only ones in the country. So you know, if yeah. you can't get any answers out of them, you know, go ahead and and uh, 
you know, reach out to, you know, Mo, other Mopar restorers in, sure. in the area. Yeah, he, he would know, but whether or not he'd give you an answer or not, it might be kind of tough to get. Yeah, yeah. yeah. or yeah. if somebody in the shop there could, or I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how, I haven't contacted them in any regard, so I think uh, they may or may not uh, be able to point you in the right direction, but at least, you know, you'll, it doesn't hurt to try. I got to believe somebody out there has painted that and mm -hmm. could tell you what Oh yeah, it's been used. There's lots of lots of Mopars in there. Yeah, absolutely, those guys are go to know, the go to the Mopar shows and ask around. You know. Yeah, they they are die hard. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, all right. With that, guys, I see we're coming up to the top of the hour. I want to thank everyone for showing up here tonight. Uh, thanks for joining us here, ah, Terry. Happy to do it. And uh, if uh, you know if. Even after this is closed up tonight, you got a, a suddenly think of a question, you go ahead and post it in the comment section. I usually read them the next day, make sure nothing got missed the next day, or if I have to follow up with anything. Uh, so, again, thanks for coming out. Appreciate it. Uh, look forward to seeing you again next month. Terry? Thank you, Mark. It was a, it was a blast. All right. Thanks, All right. guys. We'll Thank see you, you later.